Hello. I'm not used to handheld mics, so I'm not sure how far to do it. Uh, welcome to the 315 session. Uh, today we have Sarah Meguio. Uh, she will be giving her talk, Failure 101, What Life Lessons Can Teach Us About Better Software Development. Sarah has had a career that can only be described as eclectic, but the prevailing theme has been a passion for bringing people together and supporting teams to use the data to drive the best outcomes for customers, stakeholders, and business. Give a warm welcome to Sarah. Thank you. Um, now, who here has ever failed at something before? Yeah, failed to meet a deadline. Personally, I failed to get out of bed with my first one this morning, so I made it, it's fine. And who here has been part of a software project that's failed before? Yeah, maybe an incident? <laughs> well, I'm not surprised it's pretty much everyone in this room because failure is a big part of life and it's a massive part of working in tech and in building software. Code fails to execute all the time. Bugs pop up seemingly from nowhere. And sometimes, even with an IDE, you fail to find that one missing semicolon. Now, we as individuals are usually pretty good at finding the cause of these little errors. But when it comes to a big project, often it's not until that post-modern retro or that post-incident review that you sit back and go, yeah, that's why we failed. Well, luckily, I've been failing pretty much my whole life. I constantly fail. And I've worked in probably more industries than any one person should have. This is just a selection. And in the past few years, I've worked in incident and problem management, so fixing the problems, software development, causing them, and as a scrum master, trying to help others not cause them. And I am also on Twitter. I often fail to update this, but you're welcome to follow me anyway. Now, the benefit of me having worked in so many industries is that I've seen what failure looks like across all kinds of projects. And I can tell you that it's the same few things that cause a project of whatever kind to fail. But one thing I can't fail to do today is to mention the amazing sponsors who make this possible. Um, so if you haven't already, please make sure you go get your treasure map stamped, win some pretty cool stuff. So today, I'm going to use a couple of examples from my personal life, don't worry, they are embarrassing, to walk you through some of the mistakes that we made and how they can snowball into those big failures. So I'm going to take you back a bit in my life, to my childhood. I'm about five years old, it's the start of term two, and I'm at a brand new school. I'm in the pre-primary class, and I'm standing at the starting line of the very first event of the day at our athletics carnival. And then the sports teacher comes over to us and explains what this event's all about. They tell us that what you need to do is to try and run and reach the finish line as fast as you possibly can. Now, I've been around the block a bit. We're in the lead up to the Sydney Olympic Games. I've seen a running race on TV. I know exactly what it is that I'm doing here, right? And I look down the track and I can see the finish lines in each of the lanes, each with that finishing ribbon set across between the two posts. So I think to myself, yeah, I've got this. And you know what? I'm going to show everyone at my new school that I am pretty cool. So, at the finish line, ready, set, go. And we're off. We're running. I'm running as fast as my little legs can carry me. And the finish line is very rapidly coming up. I'm going to get there first. I'm going to win this. So I'm running, and I hit the finish line, and I fall flat on my face. You see, what I thought was a set of finish lines turned out to be a set of hurdles. And at five years old, I hadn't encountered this before. And not only did I fall down, 
I caused a terrible domino effect, children's limbs flying everywhere, as the person next to me fell down and cascaded down the lanes. So where did I, quite literally I might add, fall down? Well, it started with assumptions. I assumed that because this looked similar to something that I'd seen on TV, that it must be the same. And not only that, the sports teacher assumed that everyone at that, stand, like that starting line had been there the term before and attended the class where we learned exactly what hurdles were and how to jump over them and not run through them. The second mistake here was my own fear of embarrassment. I was the new kid at school, so even though I recognised this didn't look exactly the same to what I'd seen on TV, I was too scared to ask that question. And thirdly, there was some really poor communication. When that sports teacher told us to run and try and reach the finish line as fast as possible, did that really communicate what you needed to do in an event like hurdles? And look, it boils down to the fact that we didn't clearly communicate or understand the requirements. And this isn't something that affects just me. We see it every day. The $125 million Mars probe that failed because people assumed they were working in the same units. Or the junior developer who picks up a card for an API to do something, and then they build it in Java only to find out that, hey, it was meant to be built in C-sharp. So how do we avoid this? Firstly, validate your assumptions. Check with your team members, with your product owner or program manager, and if possible, with your stakeholders and end users. Ask the stupid questions. Don't be like me and let your fear of embarrassment get in the way of you asking a question, because I can pretty much guarantee someone else in the team has the same thoughts as you. And make sure that you have a shared understanding of what's required. Spend that bit of extra time in your inception and then document that for the next person. Moving on a little bit, a little bit older, a little bit wiser. And I'm in my final year of university. I'm working on my thesis, which is investigating potential causes of liver disease. Now, for anybody who's done biochemistry and seen diagrams like this before, I apologize for re-inflicting that trauma on you. For everybody else, I'm going to try and explain what it is that I was working on without throwing too many terms like de novo lipogenesis or esterified fatty acids at you. So the liver is the body's central hub for metabolism. Each one of the arrows on this diagram represents a pathway where something is metabolized from one thing to another. Um, for your context, there's about 135 of them. I cannot fit them all on one diagram. Um, but my team was invested in particularly two pathways. We're looking at how the body breaks down fats, and I was specifically focusing on how the body metabolizes iron. And as a whole, we're looking to see what happens between these two pathways when the liver gets stressed. So for your understanding, we selected our gene targets, those are the items that are sort of like boxed in blue, very carefully. We then determined what our experimental controls would be. We worked very hard to ensure that we were using the same consistent methodology. And then we got to work. For three months, we tested each of these targets, and then we came together as a whole lab group to share sort of our version of a proof of concept. And yeah, all of the genes, all of these things in blue, were giving us the results that were expected. The ones that we thought would be active were, and the ones that we thought would be quiet weren't really showing us any results. So we carried on with our work. Over the next 12 months, I tested these targets so many times. I painstakingly followed our protocols, even down to like timing the seconds out. And I honestly crunched more data than I think anybody knows what to do with. And then at the end of 12 months, we came together again, each person who took a different pathway in the liver, and shared our results. 
The only problem was they didn't line up. Now, as anybody who's been part of a software project, maybe you've dedicated a lot of time of your life to that and had it fall over or fail at the last minute, realizing that your work for 12 months of your life was wasted, that's a kick in the, the gut, that's a slap in the face. And that's exactly how I was feeling when I found out that 12 months of my life were effectively wasted. Effectively, we failed to test everything that we should have. So what didn't metabolize here in my piece of work? Well, by only testing those gene targets in blue and not everything that was happening between them, we relied on the equivalent of unit tests for an entire measure of quality. And we didn't test the entire process end to end. What happens between every single one of those 135 pathways in the liver? So we didn't even have anything to compare the results that we did generate to. And we only tested and planned for the happy path. So what happens according to plan, you know, how the liver is meant to metabolize things? And given that in this scenario, we were deliberately trying to stress it to break down the metabolic processes, we really should have considered that unhappy path. We just simply didn't test everything that we needed to. And look, that isn't something that's just restricted to medical research. Inadequate testing also contributed to the failure of TSB Bank's software migration in 2018. And that cost them 330 million pounds and lost them 80,000 customers. So that's a pretty big mistake for not testing something. So how do you get over this? How do you overcome a lack of testing? If at all possible, consult the subject meta experts before you start your development work. They can help you ensure that you're testing everything that you need to and that your development practices are robust. Please don't just rely on unit tests. As foundational, as important as they are, if they're your only measure of quality, you could be potentially missing something that'll cause you an error or a bug later. And consider the happy and the unhappy parts in your testing. Because we all know users, I am a user, and I know that I mistake, make mistakes all of the time, and I will find some way to break something. Now we come to the failure that, frankly, I'm the most embarrassed about and the most mortified. So guys, strap yourselves in if you thought that was heavy. You see, I was asked to bake a cake. It was for a friend's 21st birthday party, and they're a massive fan of the movie Madagascar. Um, so we thought, hey, it's their 21st, why not embrace this and go full kids party? I'm talking balloons, birthday patterns everywhere, piñata hanging from the ceiling. And then we thought, hey, why don't we do the birthday cake in the shape of their favourite character from the movie, King Julian? For those of you who haven't seen the movie or have forgotten, is this kooky-looking lemur with the crown? So, why was I asked to bake the cake? Well, I have a confession for you guys. I'm a stress baker. So when I get stressed, I bake. I baked recently in preparing for this talk. That's how stressed I was. And it's a hobby that I've kept up for the past several years. I've baked everything from fully edible terrarium, so I'm talking candy glass, cake for the soil, plastic, uh, sorry, uh, not plastic, uh, matte modeling chocolate. I forget the fancy French name for it. But really fancy things. I've even made cartoon character cakes before, like Finding Dory, or Dory from Finding Nemo if you didn't see the sequel. So making something like this amazing thing shouldn't be too far out of my wheelhouse, right? Shouldn't be too far from my level of expertise. So I did what anybody would do in this situation, and I went hunting on the internet for inspiration. This is just one of the items that I sort of like based my cake on. I worked out everything that I would need, and then I pre-ordered all of my ingredients, all the things I'd need for decoration. Fast forward a couple of weeks, it's 
the day before the party, and I finish work at lunchtime, so I finish early, and then I go down to collect everything that I'd pre-ordered. Only problem was, they didn't have half the stuff I ordered, including the cake that I special ordered. So, with very few options, you know, I'm a day away from this party, I had to come up with another solution. So, I came up with a list of things that I thought I could substitute in terms of ingredients. I grabbed everything that I would need to bake cakes myself, and I headed home and got baking. I just pulled the cakes out of the oven when I got a phone call from the other person organising the party, asking me to do them just a little favour, and could I run down and pick up the guy's birthday present? Now, cakes have to cool after coming out of the oven, and I definitely can't start carving them up or decorating them until that's done. And I don't know if you guys know this, but birthday present's kind of a big deal. So, sure. But as anybody who works in Perth CBD knows, that on a Friday afternoon, peak hour traffic is insane. So my quick errand quickly turned into a three hour long trip. And that meant that I just didn't have the time that I needed that evening to start assembling this cake. No problem, I wake up even earlier the next morning. I get slicing my cake down into all the shapes that I need. I start getting ready to assemble it. Only to sort of get tapped on the shoulder and told, you know that we're hosting this party, right? So we need to start setting up at about mid-afternoon and you need to go get ready. So I'm looking at my half-assembled cake and I know that it's going to take me at least another eight hours to finish assembling this, especially given I'm working with things that I am not familiar with. So something had to give. I decided I had to start from scratch. I rebaked some cakes and here's what I was able to deliver. <laughs> In a little bit over four hours, I completely rebaked cakes and I decorated. Now, look, it, it kind of, it's the minimum viable product, right? <laughs> it's a cake, it kind of resembles King Julian on it. And look, when I cut, o cut it open, you know, the, the stuff did spill out like a pinata cake. But it wasn't even close to what I wanted to deliver. It wasn't sort of what we promised. And it definitely wasn't like this image, which is what I was aiming for. So I was still understandably embarrassed, and yet here I am sharing it all with you guys. So how did I, somebody who's got years of experience with baking, become a nailed it contender? Well, the resources and tools that I planned on having, ingredients I was familiar with, pre-made cakes so I could focus on decorating, had to be substituted. The organiser didn't consider conflicting priorities. I mean, yeah, a birthday present's important, but so's the birthday cake. And realistically, I should have pushed back on me being the person to pick it up. Surely someone else could have. And I also failed to plan for changes in my own capacity, or for these unexpected things to happen. I could have allowed myself even more time. At the end, it just came down to poor planning. Now, this is a contributor to 71% of pro projects that fail, so it's a big one. And look, it's not just related to, bang uh, to baking or anything else like that. Poor planning caused a three-time cost overrun for the US National Gas Company's ERP update. So they originally budgeted $330 million, and it cost them just over a billion to finish that project. That's a lot of money. Could have been spent elsewhere. So how do we avoid becoming nailed at contenders? If at all possible, get your stakeholders, your party planners involved early, and make sure that you are on the same page when it comes to what needs to be delivered when. Plan ahead for rework, for unexpected tools and changes in your team and your own capacity. Deliver your minimum viable product and then continue to improve on it, if at all possible. 
So how do we learn from my mistakes? I mean, failure is inevitable sometimes. It's a big part of life. It's part of developing software. But you know those small mistakes that I've made along the way? That doesn't have to snowball into a massive failure. So if you can ask yourself these couple of questions the next time you're working on a software project, are we all on the same page? And is our understanding documented? Have we considered all parts in our development and our testing? And have we planned for when things go wrong? And is there a contingency plan in place? If you can answer yes to these three questions, then you would have at least learned from my mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was so good.